Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for this discussion on uh, the regulatory environment. My name is Anne Butler, and I'm uh, from the payment, newly, newly renamed Payments Canada. I'm the general counsel there and have been for just over a year. So in the interest of full disclosure, the true expert here today is, is Jacqueline, who's sitting on my left. It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Jacqueline to you, and, and we have a great program for her today. She is a very recognized expert in financial services law in Canada, and in particular in payments law, and many of you, them, of you will know her very well. Certainly, if you want to learn a little bit about payments law and financial services, just the amount of material she's written and you can find on the, on the Blake Castles website is a great place to start. Um, Jacqueline has a very busy presentation for us today. She's going to take us on a speed run through some of the evolving uh, state of regulation in, in Canada in the space of payments. She also has a few polls that she's going to ask. So in the interest of making sure we, we can get this to work smoothly, I thought I would just remind people about the polling process and um, ask a, a very important question. How many people are on Blackberries in the audience here? So there's a few. Has it worked at all for you, the polling on Blackberries? Because it has? OK, so some I've had different experience with other people. So uh, it sounds like we're good for the polls. And so if you are in the app and you're at uh, Jacqueline's uh, presentation, so our agenda item today, up at the top, there's, there's the three little bars you can click on. One of them is polls. And that's where you'll be able to execute on the polls section. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jacqueline. Uh, I have a few questions for you as we go throughout the, the uh, event today. But uh, we'll also have an opportunity for questions at the end. So thank you very much. Thanks. And welcome, everyone. And you know, this is an interesting topic because when I was trying to prepare a legal and regulatory perspective about payment disruptors and come up with sort of a message of what I thought the regulatory regime looked like and how it worked, I realized that your view on the legal and regulatory perspective on payment disruptors will depend upon who you are in the payment ecosystem. So if you're a fintech and you're a new startup company, you might find that our regulatory regime or potentially lack thereof is something that's great because it lets you come here, it lets you set roots, it lets you provide your innovative systems, it provides, and it certainly there's evidence now, and I'm going to talk about it, way more competition in the financial services sector, and it actually, at the end of the day, benefits consumers because there's better offerings for consumers. But if you're a regulated institution such, a bank, such as a bank that's subject to huge amounts of regulation already, you know, from your perspective, you're going to see these people that get to come in and start up with no regulations. They have no capital requirements, no liquidity requirements. They don't have deposit insurance. You're going to say, well, that's an unlevel playing field, and it puts us at a disadvantage. So, you know, the view on the regulatory regime, in my view, would depend upon who you are and how you view it. And so that kind of message is, is going to go through my presentation. Um, and I thought I'd start with an example that we all know and are familiar with, which is, which is Uber. Um, so most people know what Uber is. It's, it's a mobile technology app. Um, you know, so some regulators, and especially taxi drivers, say Uber is a taxi company. And others say, no, it's a technology app that just puts uh, drivers and riders together, right? And so if you think about it on one hand, we all know what a taxi is. Um, if you were taking a trip somewhere and you needed someone to give you a ride, and I said, oh, my sister's driving there. I can give you a lift. You wouldn't call that some sort of process that needs to be regulated. Or if you knew someone who was going somewhere, you said you could hook people up for rides, you wouldn't see that as a process that needs to be regulated. But at some point when it becomes um, more technology savvy, when it applies to many more people, when it's a available to the public, then it becomes more of a concern. And so when you look at Uber and you talk to people who take Uber a lot, there's huge advantages. So you, you, you take your phone, you program in where you want them to come, they come get you, they send you a text when they're coming, you know how much the cost is, you pay for it on your credit card, it's preloaded, you don't have to worry about, you know, a lot of times when you're taking taxis, some of the difficult points are getting in and out because you have to pay, you have to wait for the receipt, do they take credit, usually they do, they'll charge you a fee. Here it's done, and as you know, a lot of people say, I don't have to talk to anyone, right? You don't have to talk to a cab driver, you don't have to talk to anyone, you get it in, you know where they're going. The cars are generally new, the wait time's less, you get the receipt on your phone, so if you're dispersing it, it's great, you have, you have that record. 
Um, and there's actually, from a driver's perspective, there's lower risk because you're not carrying cash around, right? So that used to be one of the biggest risks of the taxi industry. So I think most people would say, and especially most Americans, they're very Uber-esque. They all love Uber. They have their drivers at Uber. There's actually ratings when you go onto Uber and you want to hail a, a car. It gives you a driver's rating on a scale of, of one to five. So there's great, you know, I don't personally use Uber more at all. I, I guess I suppose I would, but I haven't. But like my kids talk about, oh yeah, we Ubered. You know, so the, it's really common. But there are a lot of huge advantages. Um, of course, uh, with advantages, uh, there are people that are complaining. Well, who's complaining? Well, the taxi industry is complaining. Why is the taxi industry complaining? Because in some jurisdictions, uh, to get a taxi license, to be able to drive a taxi is anywhere from eighty to hundred thousand dollars. So people are making an investment of eighty to hundred thousand dollars to be able to drive a cab. And now here are these drivers that have no regulatory regime, no licensing fees, and they're they're competing, and their prices in some circumstances are even lower. So you have taxi drivers that are really upset, and everyone here likely knows of all the different protests that have arisen in all the different cities by taxi drivers saying, this isn't good, there's no regulatory oversight, there's no background checks, no one's checking how safe the cars are, who's screening the drivers, what's the insurance, there's no level playing field, and competitive disadvantage. So the messages that we see in Uber and what's been going on in Uber, we see translated into the, into the financial services sector. So this is just a really good exa example of something that's much more public. So what have the responses been? So from an industry perspective, you've seen massive protests by the cab drivers shutting down some main corridors. Certainly that's happened in Toronto. Um, but then you look at the car companies and there's a whole, this could be a whole other topic for another day of what's happening to our transportation industry given that people live in more urban areas and there's these ride sharing issues and people aren't going to be buying as many cars. Well, so you look at the car companies and they're getting right in there. So Toyota's actually made a strategic investment in Uber. Uh, Volkswagen's invested over $300 million into, into Get, which is an Uber rival. And GM itself has invested uh, $500 million into Lyft. So you see the industry players, where they see something new happening, they're trying to get a piece of the action as well in different ways. And then we look at the regulatory response. And for those of us in the financial services industry, you know, we talk about having to comply with provincial and federal legislation, which we deem to be a pain, right? It's like 14 different jurisdictions. Well, taxis are regulated on a municipal basis. So like looking at the city, looking at the GTA area, and not meaning to be Toronto ethnocentric, but just looking at Toronto by way of example, you have Toronto, you have Mississauga, you have uh, Oakville, you have Oshawa, you have Ajax, you have so many pieces of law, it's very difficult. And you look at the responses that have happened across Canada, and they're quite interesting. So generally, um, Uber took the view of, I'm not, I'm, you know, let's start, let's not ask for permission, let's get permission later. Let's just come in full bore. Because if Uber had come and done a regulatory analysis of whether or not it could carry on business in various jurisdictions in Canada, the answer would either be one, no, or two, it's unclear. And if you went and asked for permission, a regulator may or may not get back to you or would likely say, well, yes, you have to be regulated as a taxi company. And the way that Uber's business model works, it, it just doesn't work. Right, so most people who drive for Uber drive part-time, you know, 10 hours a week, mixing, making extra money. They cannot afford taxi licenses. This service would be shut down, just wouldn't work. So Uber's approach, rightly or wrongly, was to just come in full force. And that turned off a lot of jurisdictions, and a lot of jurisdictions have different, had different reactions to it. There were some jurisdictions where you had the regulators as part of their lunch hour going to hail Uber, Uber cars and then going in and ticketing to which Uber said, we're going to cover all the tickets, and they pay, they're paying all the tickets. Um, you had Toronto, which had a more progressive approach, saying, we don't want to shut this down. This is the real world, and this is where we're going. Um, and they've now, in Toronto, uh, created a, a new class of license for, for Uber cabs, and there's different requirements. So for example, you cannot hail Uber on the street. Uh, there's insurance requirements. Um, and the city, of course, gets a, a $30,000 fee. Um, Montreal was a little bit different. Uh, Montreal, the offices were raided by Revenue Quebec because they were concerned that Uber wasn't paying their taxes and there was a whole court motion on that and they were able to go in and get that information. Um, originally, Uber said that they would, they would pay the fines. 
There was a bill that was uh, proceeded with last week that passed that basically says that you need a taxi permit to operate Uber. And at this point, Uber is considering shutting down the app in Montreal because for reasons I said, they just can't compete on that basis. So Montreal has been tough with them. Um, in Vancouver, um, they are not operating. Um, the city said that they needed permits to be issued. At this point, they're doing something that worked for them in Mississauga. They're engaging in a letter writing campaign to the government. They're hiring drivers or having information sessions for drivers, and they're encouraging consumers to reach out to the regulators to say, hey, do something. This is a great service. Um, you know, we were trying to modernize passenger transit. But, but BC is saying that they're not going to be intimidated by methods or by things that are done in other jurisdictions. And if you're going to be launched illegally, there's going to be ramifications. Um, in Ottawa, they operated illegally since October, um, but in April 2016, uh, City Council voted to have a dual licensing system, and so they will be legal and be able to operate there. Um, in Calgary, uh, the city obtained an injunction against them, um, but a bylaw was approved in February of this year allowing them to operate. Um, but, uh, but they said that they're not going to resume operations because the bylaw basically provides a $220 fee per driver to get licensed, which I'm told doesn't work where you're driving 10 hours a week because people aren't going to pay to work, as they put it. And while Uber does background checks, uh, Calgary wants many more background checks, and they're saying it's not viable, so they're not going to operate. In Edmonton, uh, there were all kinds of issues, but they finally reached agreement that they will allow them to operate, but they need a specific type of insurance. They passed the bylaw immediately in February, and it came into effect immediately. However, the insurance that they require drivers to get uh, is a new class of insurance, and Intact is saying it's going to provide that insurance, but legally it cannot provide that insurance till July 1st. So Uber's asked the city, can you wait to implement this bylaw to July 1st? They said no. So they have absolutely no legal way of operating, and they've had to shut down their services until July. Um, and Mississauga, I told you before, they originally shut it down, and then Uber was savvy, and they did a complete huge letter writing campaign. They had consumers write in. They did surveys that consumers prefer Ubers to cabs, and then Mississauga uh, backed down. It's allowing them to operate and is having licensing. So as you can see from... The, 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 the regulatory response, it's all over the map. Um, at the end of the day, this is a product that consumers clearly want. So the, the issue becomes, you know, sometimes regulators miss that point and they just say, well, we need to protect consumers because they don't know what's good for them. So, you know, we don't care if it's not financially feasible, uh, this is what we're doing. And I've, I've seen that in other regulatory situations. You go to a regulator, you go, well, if you're going to make me do these things, I can't make any money on my product, and my product is no longer viable, and I can't offer it. And a lot of times regulators go, well, sorry, the law is the law. And other times regulators will be understand, okay, well, this is a great service, like Toronto did, more akin to Toronto. So let's try to make it, it work, and let's try to have a level playing field. And so it, it forces taxi drivers, um, it, you know, it regulates Uber drivers, but it forces the taxi drivers and the taxi industry to modernize as well, to potentially get cleaner cars. Now that in some jurisdictions, um, taxis are allowed to offer different fares depending on peak times. So one of Uber's business models is if you're requesting an Uber at a peak time, the price will be higher than if you're requesting at a non-peak time. That's been one of the criticisms where in cities where subways have shut down for various reasons, all of a sudden the price goes through the roof, unlike cabs. So uh, different issues and just different regulatory responses. So it just kind of gives you a sense of regulators deal with things differently and, you know, things aren't you know, the technology and the innovation and the financial innovation is going to move forward. We have to address it. We can't shut down or Canada is not going to be seen as a jurisdiction that people want to come here and expand their products. So as I said, their approach to the Canada was ask first, uh, was move first and ask questions later. And if anyone's done any reading on PayPal, that was actually their approach as well. They came in, they carried on business in the U.S., they act as a processor for eBay. They didn't register under money service legislation. They didn't regulate themselves as a bank. They were about to go public, and the night before they went public, the th four states said, okay, we're shutting you down because you're a money service business. But clearly what they offered and what they provide is something that consumers wanted, and so they worked with the regulators, and obviously PayPal out there today is a, is a thriving um, industry member. So I'm not necessarily advocating moving forward and not complying with laws. I'm just saying Sometimes it's important for regulators to understand there's a consumer demand for things to be able to address them properly. 
So now that we have that, I thought we'd, we'd move forward and just talk more about financial services and payments. And so I was going to start with Bitcoin because I thought that was really, if we're going to talk about things that are changing the world, that would be one. So has anyone owned or ever used Bitcoin? So the majority, no. Um, okay, so um, B Bitcoin is, is very interesting. Um, do people generally here know what Bitcoin is? Um, so Bitcoin itself is a, is a digital or a virtual currency. Um, the thing that is incredible about Bitcoin, other than it moves um, over the internet, is the underlying technology behind Bitcoin, which is the blockchain. And I'm sure most people have heard of the blockchain because um, you basically, if you're doing anything in the financial services world, you cannot um, be carrying on business without having heard of the blockchain. And it's it's hard to explain, and I have this graph, but it's probably hard to see, but I'll do my best. So. What the blockchain is, in effect, is it's a, a ledger. That's the easiest way to think of it. It's a ledger of transactions. And each, each transaction is a separate block in a chain. And the reason that it's, it's, it's viewed as, you know, basically it's going to change the world is because fraud on the blockchain is very difficult. And the reason is because every block carries the tra every transaction behind it. If you wanted to go and alter something in the block, it wouldn't work because the block before and the block after it have to be changed. The whole chain would have to be work changed to to, um, to to allow for fraud. I'm not didn't explain that very well, but every transaction is has a node and it's codified and it follows a chain. So you can see, for example, let's talk about um, moving a security or moving a bitcoin. You can trace on the blockchain where that bitcoin went. You can follow it the whole way along. So it's very difficult for someone. To potentially go in and steal the the bitcoin because you are on that ledger showing the the chain of ownership um, and so really really nifty novel technology it is it's called a distributed public ledger so it's this ledger is public it's available to everyone and it's the transactions are approved through complicated logarithms that are done by computers everywhere um, that basically look at the equation and say, oh, does this work? This, this transaction was transferred from A to B. And they do all these logarithms and complicated calculations. They're called miners. And they mine the transactions. And when the transaction or the mathematical equation is approved, and it's proved by the people that are doing that, then it, it, it registers as, as a node and moves forward. And so. For every, people talk about Bitcoin being anonymous, but for every single Bitcoin transaction that occurs, there actually is a record of that Bitcoin moving through the system. Um, so it doesn't show that Jackie Shinfield's Bitcoin moved through the system, but you can trace that the Bitcoin I bought went to, went to X transaction, Y transaction. You can trace everything. And if you talk to law enforcement that have looked at the Bitcoin blockchain ledger, they've actually been able um, to trace transactions and the genesis of transactions through that blockchain because it keeps a really good ledger of what's happening. Um, and so that is definitely one of the advantages uh, of, of Bitcoin and its virtual currency. It's new, it's novel, it's interesting, and it's potentially where, where things are going. Um, so the advantages are uh, f freedom and payment, um, you know, transaction speed, things are done fairly quickly, it's anonymous, so when people are worried about giving credit card information or personal information, these are anonymous transactions. Um, I don't want to get into too much of the technology, uh, but the, to do the Bitcoin, there's two pieces. There's this public ledger, and then everyone has this private key. So your private key is your private to you, and the anonymous part of the transaction is on the ledger, but everyone has their own private key. And when you hear about Bitcoin that have been stolen or lost, it's not that ledger that's been affected. It's people's private keys that have been stolen, and that allows people to transact. So that, that's been the issue. But on the, on the public system, on the chain itself, um, there's no private information. So all the identity thefts that we think about, n not happening there. Um, it's cryptographically secure. So because of the technology that's used, it's very difficult for that protocol to be manipulated. Very little fees. Um, you To get Bitcoin, you have to go to a Bitcoin exchanger. So you go in to exchange your fiat currency for Bitcoin, and you come out through the exchanger. The fees are, are very low. Um, transactions are irreversible. So once they're done, you can't go back and alter the blockchain. Um, so they're irreversible. So there's certainty and finality of payment. And you own your own Bitcoin in the private key. So um, 
you know, that's, people see that as beneficial for many reasons uh, because, again, it's your information. It's not publicly out there. Um, concerns, uh, Bitcoin's price has been volatile. Um, there's no, so when you talk about consumer protection and the like, there's not a lot of protection because transactions are, are irreversible. They're anonymous. So that's, that's the biggest downfall of this. They're anonymous. So therefore, if people here have heard of Silk Road. Silk Road was basically an Amazon of drug purchasing. So you would go on and they would say, oh, this guy sells great marijuana. He delivers it. Sealed packages. It's undetectable. Oh, this, and there, it was a huge drug selling website that all payments were made through Bitcoin. So the concern is that if someone is a exchanger and I want to buy Bitcoin, so even if there's AML imposed, which I'll talk about on the seller of the, of the, of the Bitcoin, um, they can identify me and they can get all the information they need on me, but they don't necessarily know where my Bitcoin has been sent because of the, the anonymousness. So what, what has been the Canadian regulatory response to Bitcoin? So there was a report by the Senate Standing Committee in June of 2015 called You Can't Flip This Coin. And they basically came up and they advocated for light touch regulation. They said, we don't really know where this is going and what's going to happen with it, but we don't want to shut it down. So other than AML concerns, which we have, uh, we think this is something good and we think regulation is necessary, not necessarily regulation. So they really talked about a light touch regulation. Um, of course, the CRA doesn't want to miss its share of, of money here. So they put out guidance on basically the fact that Bitcoin transactions should be treated as barter transactions. And so if you sell something for Bitcoin, you should still be paying your GST on it. If you buy Bitcoin and it increases in value, you should be thinking about capital gains taxation and self-declaring. And if you are a miner, you should think about Bitcoin being in your inventory. So CRAs definitely had a view on that and that's public. Um, so one thing that was passed, one of the concerns, as I was saying, is basically because it's anonymous under, under, um, and there's risks for AML, there has been legislation passed. It's Bill C-31 under the Proceeds of Crime legislation. And that legislation proposes regulating people who deal in virtual currencies. And so there is draft, there's a definition of a, of a dealer in virtual currency. The thought is it'll be regulated similar to money services business, but right now there's no regulations out there, so it's not in force. Um, and the regulations, my understanding is, are gonna be released in the fall. Um, when you went to FinTrack and asked for guidance previously and said, hey, are these Bitcoins regulated? FinTrack said, looked at the law, law talks about you know, funds transfer, taking funds, transferring funds. And it's basically taken the view um, that uh, these digital currencies, currencies are not legal tender, therefore they're not funds transfers, therefore the legislation doesn't effectively apply. Um, so that, that's federal. Now, of course, we have Quebec and they have the AMF and they have a, a Money Service Businesses Act. And that act, unlike the federal act, regulates ATMs. And so they were very quick to come out and say, that if you are getting your Bitcoin at an ATM machine, that ATM machine is regulated and should be registered as a money service business. And then they came out in March 2015 without any notice, without any consultation, and said if you are operating a platform that specifically deals with digital currency, you're also regulated and required to be registered. Um, but otherwise, there really isn't a regulatory framework. So Jacqueline, just before you move on to the next slide, I wonder if you could um Give us your thoughts about um, where Bitcoin's going uh, in terms of its establishment. It, right now, it's, it's playing a role. It and other cryptocurrencies are really playing a sort of a niche currency role. You know, you showed that the, the, the tax authorities see it as barter. What's holding Bitcoin back from becoming a more mainstream currency? And are there legal and regulatory issues you think that are barriers for that happening? So what's holding Bitcoin back as, or any digital currency as being a regulated currency is from a legal perspective, we need to have changes to the Currency Act to declare what legal tender is. So that's the first thing, that's not legal tender. Um, so that's, that's important. In terms of mainstream adoption, there is a lot of concern um, both at the government and at the industry level about what can be done with digital currencies and the fact that they're anonymous. And so the concern is where are these monies going? So I can send a bit, so you can certainly know who I am when I buy my Bitcoin, but you don't know where on the chain I'm sending that Bitcoin. I can be sending it to Syria. I can be sending it to a conflict zone. I can be sending it to Russia, where technically you're not allowed to 
be transacting with certain people in Russia because of the sanctions laws. Um, so certain jurisdictions like China and Russia have shut Bitcoin down and said it's illegal. We haven't done that, but there hasn't been a huge uptake in, in Bitcoin, I would say, generally. And part of it is because Canadian banks at this particular point in time, there's no formal policy, they won't bank Bitcoin exchangers. So if you are a Bitcoin exchanger and you can have the best AML policy that there is, you're not gonna get a Canadian bank to open a bank account for you. In the US, Silicon Valley Bank will deal with it and there's, there's huge amounts of money that have been poured into Bitcoin. So at this point, until um, digital currencies are embraced more and until there's changes made to the Currency Act to allow for it, I don't think there'll be uptake. Um, I think it's coming because that's we're just we're working in we're living in a digital world and that's coming but we just aren't there yet. Um, there is some hope for those involved in the in the in the Bitcoin industry that the new anti money laundering regulations when they come in place will give financial institutions some comfort that when they onboard currency Bitcoin exchangers that they're regulated so it's not like they're just onboarding companies that have no regulations applicable to them but they're onboarding companies that have some regulation but the the real future of Bitcoin or the like I say would come from blockchain which I just talked about so that that's really the technology that the the, the brilliance of Bitcoin is not so much the Bitcoin it's that underlying blockchain technology and there's a, a book was just released about blockchain by the Tapscots which and there was a huge cocktail party at the Canadian Embassy I mean this is it and this is where we're going and that it's that blockchain technology uh, that underscores Bitcoin that's really going to have viability going forward um, so yeah, most people are using or exploring blockchain technology. So that's really where the benefits of, of Bitcoin are, are going and, and moving forward. Um, so the, it is, as I said before, the technology underlying Bitcoin. Uh, again, it, it provides an immutable record. It discards the needs for trusted third parties. So when you think about payments, there's always a third party involved somewhere. So if you're dealing... Um, you know, with a credit card, you have the networks in between. If you're dealing with a bank, you have the CPA. There's always third parties involved to move currency, to move transfer. The, the advantage of the blockchain is it eliminates that. Just things move freely. And it's a record that really can't be changed by anyone. Oh, why don't we go forwards instead of backwards? Um, so what is the industry response to, to blockchain? Well, this is something that people are really excited about. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with R3, and that's a huge consortium of uh, 42 financial institutions that are doing all kinds of projects dealing with research and development on blockchain. If you don't know about R3, go Google them. There's very big financial institution names that you're all familiar with. Um, most institutions have 10 to 20 blockchain projects on the go, and there's, you know, the funding and the spending is expected to be in the billions of dollars range. And so people are looking at it for money transfer, for digital currency exchange, cross-border payment, so, you know, one system everywhere, right? We think now about cross-border payments, it takes days to clear. On this system, they clear immediately. Um, smart contracts, so contracts where parties know the variables, enter them in and they automatically uh, move on the blockchain. So let me give you the easiest example. Um, the, I, I guess sports betting would be the easiest example. Uh, doing a sport betting as a, as a blockchain contract. You would set up that using the code, and I'm not a techie, but you'd code it to say, okay, we agree that the website of the NHL will be the definitive um, authority for this transaction. And so you, have, you link to that and then you would code in I want, I'm, you know, betting for the Pittsburgh Penguins to win the Stanley Cup. And you would, you would put that into the smart contract. So one side of the smart contract would be, if the, if the Penguins win the Stanley Cup, then I get this much money, right? And so what happens is when the, payment, when the Penguins win the Stanley Cup, the transaction would automatically process without the need for any intervention because all the variables would already be entered into the system. That's just one example. There's all kinds of other examples. Things dealing with insurance, um, insurance coverage where there's specifically dealing with things that may affect weather, where you agree that, you know, um, Environment Canada is going to be the, the record for a weather event, an event that you're covered by insurance if there's a frost issue, if you're a farmer or something. And so there's no human intervention needed. If X, then Y, you program your contract that way, and that's how it works. So on the blockchain, there's a, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Ethereum, and there's a whole session on blockchain tomorrow, so I'm not going to go into that. This is happening, and this is real, and there's 
hundreds of projects out there that deal with smart contracts. Um, securities trading platform. So right now the Toronto Stock Exchange actually has someone working there who's the head of digital technology who's working on having stocks transfer immediately. Because right now when you buy shares, there's a whole period. If you have the stock ledger on a blockchain, immediate transfer. And they're also doing that in Australia right now. So there's a lot of uptake there. And the regulators, uh, there's a lot of industry interest. The regulatory response, again, uh, it's it, the Senate Banking Committee talked about when it talked about Bitcoin, it also talked about blockchain uh, being light touch regulation. Um, uh, regulation. Um, and then we don't really have, um, our legislation is basically technology neutral. So you have to look at what you're doing and what the use of what you're doing is to determine if it's regulated. You just can't say, oh, you're using the blockchain, therefore it's regulated. So what are you doing with it? How are you using it? If you're doing it to engage in consumer transactions and you're doing something online, then the consumer protection disclosures of certain provincial legislation are going to kick in regardless of whether you're using the blockchain or not. So it's really looking at the use to determine what law applies. Um, right now, OSFI is looking into the risk of using that technology. And then the path forward. I think it's really important to have flexible regulation. I think that's recognized. Um, and I see this as two types of regulation will move forward. There's going to be potential regulation of the blockchain system itself. And there's going to be potential regulation of users of that system. So if I'm a consumer and I want to do something and I want to go into the blockchain or engage in a transaction that deals with the blockchain, then I'm probably going to have to get some type of disclosures so I understand what I'm doing and that the transactions that I'm engaging in may be irreversible. And for the system itself, the type of regulation of the blockchain will depend on who's using it and what it's being used for. Um, if it's being used by financial institutions to transfer value, you know, OSFI is going to have some specific things about that. There's going to need to be um, all kinds of protocols in place for backup systems, um, for where things are stored, for how information is held. So I think there'll be some regulation of the system itself, depending on its use, and some regulation of people that are going to interact with the system. But right now, it's really early days and baby steps, and there's not a lot of regulation. So Jackie, uh, thinking about um, a financial system that is, is so networked and so international, uh, how, how do you think um, blockchain is going to evolve from a you know international standards perspective? I mean, how how it seems to me it's very transformative for the regulatory environment altogether. Yeah, I agree with that. So it's it's going to depend on what the blockchain is used for. So there's different kinds of blockchains. There's public blockchains where the whole world participates, and then there's private blockchains. So for example, the banks could like if we think about the the CPA, the banks could have their own private blockchain where just banks participate and where just the servers of the banks determine what is done and not done with that system and how it validates transactions. But if we're talking about a public ledger blockchain, like in the Bitcoin world, that's global. It's for everyone to participate. And that's the beauty of it. The participation is, is simple, it's easy, and it's universal. Everybody can be involved. The issue then becomes how you get your value in and how you get your value out and who's holding that money and where are you at risk to take that currency when it's no longer digitized and turn it into fiat currency. Having said that, if digital currency becomes the uniform, then even though it's in that chain, that's digital currency and it's recognition of value. So in terms of how um, blockchain would potentially be regulated, I, I look at the adoption of the Consumer Code, which was uh, originally talked about by the Conservative government in 2013. Um, and nothing's happened since, but I understand that there's a lot of meetings on FinPay and they're working through it. And maybe this will be a place to try to address general principles uh, dealing with blockchain as opposed to um, you know, having different pieces of legislation in, in different provinces. Um, and now I'm going to move to FinTech. Uh, and I guess my next question, do I think FinTechs are regulated? Well, that's awesome. Um, most people say yes, because if you talk to certain uh, banks, they would say no. Um, all kinds of offerings in fintech. I was going to go through them, but I want to be able to have time to go to my final point, so I'm not, but they're up here for your view. And, and then how are the products regulated? Well, this is what I was saying earlier. Sometimes it's who you are and not what you do. So if you're a bank and you make loans, you have certain disclosure requirements, you have certain capital requirements, you have liquidity requirements, you have to do AML on the person. If you are not a bank, not the same. No capital requirements, no liquidity requirements, no AML requirements. So, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer lending or the platform lending to small businesses, very different if you're a bank, if you're a non-bank. The other thing is banks have a requirement anytime they provide a person a product 
So you have to tell them how to contact their regulator if they need to complain. It's a very active complaints regime. So they not only have a regulator looking after them, they have consumers coming down. The non-fintechs wouldn't have anything like that. No insurance requirement. So um, very different whether you're a bank or you're not a bank. Uh, and that's what I was speaking of before. Again, industry response. The banks are saying it's an unlevel playing field. Uh, fintechs are saying don't put regulation in now it'll hamper us. Although you're finding that there's great products now that are being offered because the banks are partnering with the fintech. So there's all kinds of, if you read the media, there's all the banks are making interests or investments or partnerships with fintechs. The banks are complaining that the Bank Act isn't broad enough to allow for different types of investments because the language in the Bank Act is limited to banks only being able to undertake the business of banking or things that appertain there too. So sometimes depending on the nature of the product, it gets blurry if it's a product that appertains there too. There's also limits on the type of investments banks can make in certain entities. There's limits on referrals. So there's a lot that has to be changed from a bank perspective in order for the banks to be able to engage in the fintech industry more fully. Uh, but banks are uh, lowering prices. So if people go online, there is benefits to consumers. They're lowering prices. They're offering different product offerings where you only pay for what you need. They're, so it, the innovation of the fintech industry is causing banks to become uh, much more advocating for consumers, providing much better products. And, and how are regulators responding? Um, well, the uh, Competition Bureau just last month said it's commencing a study to determine if fintech should be regulated. And literally just yesterday, the AMF in Quebec announced that it was putting together a fintech working group up to analyze the technology innovations in the financial services sector and anticipate potential regulatory and consumer issues. So they're looking into it. Um, and I guess what I want to close off on is the unintended effects of regulation. So I'm all for regu regulation. We have to be really careful. Right now, Canada's fintech sector is growing. We have a lot of startups here. It's seen as an attractive place to come do business. But when we put regulations in place without thinking through what they do, they have, they have really negative effects on the economy. The, the easiest one I could talk about is, is prepaid cards. We drafted prepaid card legislation years ago to deal with closed loop gift cards. Basically, that was how it was drafted. So you want to go, you go to Indigo, you buy your $50 gift card, you use it to go to stores. It doesn't cost Indigo anything. Actually, Indigo makes money because they take that $50 up front, they have it in a float, and they earn interest on it. Very different from a general purpose Visa MasterCard that can be used all over the country, that has built in zero liability protection, that has fraud management, that the consumer doesn't need any money for the losses because it's in the Visa or MasterCard or other type of network. And there's huge costs to those, right? They can't expire, so you have to always engage in your ongoing monitoring. Um, it's the system select is used all over the world, so these cards can be used globally. And the legislation in a lot of provinces says you can't charge any fees. Well, you cannot offer these types of cards if you can't charge fees, because who's going to offer a product where you lose money? Okay? In the US, they have payroll cards, where people can get their payroll on these cards. Our legislation doesn't contemplate that. The, the labor legislation doesn't even allow for in a lot of circumstances. There's government benefit cards in the U.S. People get their government benefits on these cards. The way our law is drafted, you can't, you, you can't do any of that right now, and there's huge class action risk. And so, you know, when I have people calling me from the U.S. who want to come here and issue prepaid cards, I say, unless it's a promotional card, don't bother right now. So it's a situation where people put legislation in place. It was really meant to address one type of product. It's not broad enough. It doesn't catch what's required. And, it's, and when we talk to regulators that we're not going to offer the product anymore, regulators go, well, okay, that's nice. Like, people don't understand. It's going back to the Uber example. Um, mobile payments. So obviously there's a lot of Apple Pay, Google Pay, and you know, all the payments, Samsung Pay. This is amazing technology where people can use their phone to pay for things. It's all tokenized, so it's actually technically more secure than handing people your plastic card. But yet, we're concerned about merchants. Nothing against merchants, but we're concerned against merchants. And we don't want merchants to feel that they must accept these. And we, if the price goes up to accept them, merchants need to be protected. So we passed a consumer code that specifically, or a debit and credit code that says, merchants don't have to accept these if they don't want. So that's great for technology and innovation. How are people going to be spending money to develop and market apps when a merchant can add a dime stone to say, yeah, I don't want this anymore? Like, just no forethought into, you know, there's one thing you can certainly regulate and say, merchants should not be charged more for using a tap type product than for using a plastic product. Then we're all on a level playing field. But to just say merchants can decide not to accept it, why would you take 
a, a huge industry like this that's moving forward and put the power in the hands of the merchant. Can't explain, can't understand. We could have a whole other session about that. Um, and the last one, which really I have a bee in my bonnet, is AML identity verification. So AML identity verification right now, if anyone knows anything about it, in non-face-to-face, -face, it is impossible, unless you're a credit card issuer, it is impossible to verify identity online in real time. So, you know, people now, it's a give me now society. You go online, you want a credit card or you want a product, you want it now. You don't want to have to send in a photocopy of your ID or wait till you provide them a copy of your utility bill. The more times you ask somebody for something, the, the, the more drop off there is, right? So they've now upgraded the identity verification requirements. They're about to re be released next week, the final regs. And they now provide a little bit more flexibility. So they say, okay, it's two out of three. So you need to look at a, an independent source that verifies person's name and address or an independent source that verifies a person's uh, name and date of birth. And if you get those two things together, we're good. And so then when you go through the guidance that they've they haven't published yet, but it will be published. Um, and you look at what the regulations say, it says it has to be an original document. Well, what does that mean, it has to be original document? It, it means that if you, if you can show that you have a bank statement from your bank that has your name and your address, or you can show that you got a utility bill that has your name and address, or you can show that you have another piece of paper that has your name and your date of birth, it isn't accepted if it's not an original. We're in an electronic age. What does an original even mean? Makes no sense. Um, they have these amazing products in the US, amazing, where in most US state driver's licenses, there's actually a chip in them, a special chip. And they have technology now where you can go on, um, on, on like a Skype call with these service providers. You hold up you and your driver's license so they can see if the picture matches. And then they can actually through the use of their computers, determine if there is a chip in that driver's license. So it's actually more effective identity verification than face-to-face -face taking a driver's license. So is there a chip in there? And they can tell if it's a fraud or a forgery, right? Canadian government won't accept that, not acceptable. There's other methods where you go online, you give people access to your personal profile, to different information. They go online, they look at the picture, they make sure you are who you say you are. No, we're not accepting Skype. So and there's all kinds of products. I can go on and on. If you go online and you Google US verification products, 95% of them will not be accepted in Canada. And the law hasn't even come into force yet. It doesn't come into the force till next week. And in my view, it's already outdated and doesn't take into, into mind where we're going technology-wise. So I'm all for regulation. I'm all for innovation. But I think regulators have to understand what they're doing, what they're regulating, how it's going to affect the market. And I think we need to be slow. We, need, we can't rush into this because we don't want to have our market one as people say, yeah, we're not going there because then we're not going to be able to benefit from it. Um, so again, like I said, sometimes depending on who you are, you'd have a different view of the regulation. But happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Jackie. I have a ton of questions for you, but I'm going to defer to the audience because I think that that's probably more important. And I can grab you at another time. I told you we would learn a lot from Jackie today, and we also saw a lot of passion at the end. So um, I'm, hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping we have some good questions from the audience where we can continue that passionate discussion. So over to you. Questions? Did people hear the question at the back? Were we good? Yeah, so, yeah. so they've done an amazing job of educating themselves so they can have that regulatory framework. We are just starting, right? So OSFI is just now examining. The Competition Bureau is now just looking into it. So we're not even there yet. I think that's a great model because people understand the expectations before they come in and what's going to happen. And they understand that industry is friendly to it and that government is friendly to it so that they know that if there's issues, they'll be dealt with. We don't, I think, in my view, we don't have that security here yet because we don't know which direction the government's going. But obviously, the more certainty of the regulatory regime and the more understanding 
that people understand the regulators will, will listen to what they have to say and make sure that the regulations deal with their products, I think we're in a much, I, we're in a much better position to, to attract that investment, right? As opposed to people going, well, that's the law, I'm sorry, right? So yeah, that's why partly why it's worked. Because when you have some certainty that you're going to invest all this money in a market, you don't want it shut down then because people don't understand your product and what you're doing. So we are well behind that in terms of where we are now. We're just starting to look into that now. There's consultation periods just going on now. The AMF, the Competition Bureau, Austria starting to examine. So we're just very much at the beginning stages. Other questions? Yes. So there's a few things. Um, I think the most important thing is we think of regulators as these people that are passing the law and the be all and end all. And actually, they don't know a lot about what we do in our products. And I know that kind of seems bizarre, but that's my experience. And so what I'm very, very big on and I engage all my clients is let's go visit them. Let's go visit them. Let's do a slideshow. Let's exp so when I was dealing with a, a, an exchange, a Bitcoin exchanger, you know, let's go do a slideshow. Let's go explain to the government what our product is, how it works, who uses it, and what the benefits are. And educate them. And they actually appreciate that. And they sit and take notes. And when they have a really good understanding of your product and they pass the regulations, they're much more in tune with what's happening. So I'm very big on when we're doing something and when we're thinking of something and we have a product, it's like, let's get in front of the regulators now. Let's go visit them. Let's establish a dialogue. So if they're ever thinking of anything, they'll come to us and ask us for our input, because they do. But most importantly, we need to educate them. Because there's, you know, I know from my perspective, I used to always think, well, they're passing the regulations. Of course they understand this. Well, they don't. So it's really important to, 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 to do some education and educate them about our product so that hopefully the regulations will follow. And we have had some success in that in, in different venues. So when I talked about early about credit cards and their regulations being different, that was a huge group that got together, that went to regulators, explained that you know not all banks have bricks and mortar and we can't you know look at someone's ID, we don't have a branch. So, it, so one is education, two is depending on the industry you're in, industry associations. A large voice from an industry association is better than just one voice. One voice is good, but the more voices, the better. And it gives you more power when you can go through an industry association. So we probably have just one more question. Is there one more question from the audience? So we, we, when they released that, they released these in July 4th of last year, there was a huge comment period and everyone came out and said that. And it looks like they basically ignored us and carried on. So, you know, FinTrack, we could have a whole other session about that. They're a different regulator and they're a different animal. Um, but, you know, if someone would have gone through, I actually did a panel with FinTrack a while ago where I went through all these amazing identity verification things and went, so would this be allowed? And the regulator went, no, no. So, you know, I think there's just not a lot of thought and there's this like, yeah, we're the police and we're here to fight crime. And like, I'm huge on AML, but there's just, they missed the boat on that and they're just a different type of regulator. So I agree with you, there's sometimes it's not going to work. But, you know, the, the financial institution regulators, you know, from the safety and soundness perspective, they tend to be reasonable in, in my view. And they will listen to what you have to say as long as they don't see consumer risk or institution risk. But it does strike me that for for the, the moving forward with innovation and modernization, that AML is an area that really needs to get solved because it's a huge point of friction and delay, uh, and and expense in the system. And so so this 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 while a technical area, it's really critical to the modernization of the the infrastructure in the entire country. And the reason there wasn't as much pushback is the AML right now is so bad that this was this was a hundred percent improvement, right? 
seriously. So, you know, so for example, now you can verify identity by doing a credit report as long as it's three years old. So that's one method, instantaneous, great. Now it cuts out students, it cuts out new immigrants, but it's way better than what we had. So we kind of had to weigh that from where we are. Like from where we are to where we've been is way better, but it's just not even close. I think we're, we're over time, but uh, great discussion. And, and Jackie will be uh, hanging around if there are additional questions, and you can seek her out throughout the conference. You're here till uh, Thursday. Thursday yep. So uh, I invite you and encourage you to, to get some time with her if you have additional follow-on questions. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Jacqueline, for a very interesting session. Thank you.